The U.S. and Canada now in the middle of a trade dispute. The Commerce Department moving to impose a tariff on softwood lumber that enters the United States from Canada. Joining us right now from Washington is Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross. Secretary Ross, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Well, is thank this, you, Becky. It's great to see you, but is this the beginning of a trade war with Canada? I don't think so. Uh, by and large, things are pretty calm between the U.S. and Canada, but within the last week, there have been these two incidents, the terrible event with the dairy farmers in Wisconsin. Last a week ago, when I was in Japan with Vice President Pence, uh, President Trump was out in Wisconsin announcing the Buy America, Hire America program, and there he encountered some women whose farms were being taken away. They were losing their farms because the Canadians had apparently ended the importation into Canada of a certain very high filtered milk. So it was a very emotional scene for him. And now it's being followed this week by the unfortunate necessity of having to put a billion dollar tariff on uh, softwood lumber that was subsidized coming into the U.S. I mean, this has been a long-running dispute, I know, in terms of the lumber that's gone on for, for decades at this point. Is this something that you think is fixable? The Canadians are saying they're going to sue. What do you think the next step becomes? Well, I'm sure that they will. Well, first of all, this is a preliminary finding. There's a whole process. There'll be another X days till we get to the final. But generally speaking, the preliminary finding and the final are pretty much the same. I'm sure the Canadians will take whatever appeals they can. And one of the peculiarities with NAFTA, one of the very bad features, is that often the panel turns out to be three Canadians and two Americans. <laughs> so you have the strange situation of foreign nationals deciding whether or not the Commerce Department properly applied its rules. Hey, Wilbur, can you just help us try to understand if you're a CEO, um Global CEO this morning, waking up, reading this news, is this something larger, um, not just about a trade war uh, with either Canada or Mexico, but, but a larger discussion about trade and, and a takeaway that, that, that's different than just this particular issue? Well, I think there is a larger takeaway. The Trump administration has been much more focused on enforcement <clears throat> than had been true previously. And there's a good reason for that. U.S. is the least protectionist of the major powers, and yet we have the highest deficit, 500 billion. The other countries that talk about free trade are really very protectionist, Europe, China, Japan. So they have the rhetoric of free trade, but the reality of protectionism. That set of facts is not going to be permitted to continue. Their rhetoric must match their behavior and hopefully by changing their behavior and if need be we will do more to defend our borders. Mr. Secretary earlier this morning we were joined by Ian Bremmer and he likened this move to something like the strike on, on Syria. He says it's very targeted, very measured uh, and sends a measure, it sends a clear message. Would you agree with that analogy? Well, I wouldn't regard the Canadian situation as being anything like the war with ISIS, but it certainly is a very precise set of tariffs on a very precise set of, of imports. Well, the reason we're putting it on is Canada's forests are owned by the various provinces, and the provinces charge very discounted, we believe very subsidized prices to the lumbermen, mm -hmm. which in turn lets them get a subsidized low price coming into the U.S. It simply seems unfair because in the U.S. most of the forests are privately owned and therefore they pay full market rate for the stumpage. Hey, Wilbur, it's Brian Sullivan. Do you worry that Canada will respond? You know, listen, one of, the, one of their biggest th cars and machinery, but things like fruit juice, things, you know, Coca-Cola's earnings route today. Obviously, you've got orange juice, fruit juice, a lot of sugar in some of these products. You could make the argument that the United States does unfairly subsidize sugar. Many people have said that. Do you feel that, that Canada is going to reciprocate with something on a product that would be close to a big, big U.S. corporation's heart? 
Well, I think they already did, in effect, with, with wrecking the uh, dairy industry. Um, it seems a little strange to me that you would effectively prohibit dairy products from the U.S. going into Canada. They, they have this very complicated system for dairy management up there, but it basically is very, very protectionist. So I think between that system and the dumping of lumber, you have some signs that NAFTA is not working very well. If we really had free trade between the two countries, how are they blocking U.S. exports of milk to them, and how are they dumping lumber down here? So it just shows how, what a terrible arrangement NAFTA has been, not just at the southern border, but also at the northern border. Hey, Wilbur, uh, talking about trade, we, we're hearing uh, an outline uh, about uh, the tax plan that we're going to hear about tomorrow from the Trump administration. Uh, but the one thing we haven't heard about is the border adjustment tax. Is that dead? I don't know that it's dead because the budget that's being put in will be an opening salvo in the whole tax negotiations. So we'll have to see what comes out the other end. I think what is a little different is the president seems to have been making it clear that if he needs to have a little higher near-term deficit out of which we can grow with all the stimulus, it sounds as though he may be up for that. And therefore, we might be uh, taking on more debt. Do you think that's politically palatable? We were having a conversation with Jason Furman earlier just about making the math work. Even if you do it uh, with dynamic scoring, it, it's hard. And there are going to be conservatives out there uh, and Democrats, obviously, on the other end who are going to say no. Well, Jason, if I recall correctly, was part of the Democratic administration. And under Obama, there was more new national debt incurred than cumulatively for all the presidents before. So I think people from that administration have very little grounds for criticizing a near-term deficit by the president. But it, just, just so we understand in terms of the math, uh, you're willing to take on debt. How much debt do you think uh, will be politically palatable to take on, if you will? Oh, the, the whole thing about tax, while I'm obviously very interested in it, is not directly a function of the Commerce Department. It is, in fact, more the Treasury Department and the people in the Congress. Right. So um, I, I don't want to comment before they actually come out with their final budget. Where do you expect to see new trade deal, deals developing? Where, what, what areas of the world do you think are, we're most likely to strike new deals with first? Well, think about it. U.S. actually has very few free trade agreements. Uh, Mexico, for example, has 43 agreements, including with the European Union. We don't have a trade deal with the European Union. We don't have a trade deal with Japan. <clears throat> we don't have a trade deal with China. And I think there's a real reason for that, a structural problem. Prior administrations have made so many unilateral concessions to our trading counterparties that we don't have a lot left to give them. For example, the tariff on autos going into Europe is 10%. Wow. Our tariff is two and a half. Tariff going into China with autos is 25%. Now, how do we go to China and say, you have a 25% tariff, we have two and a half, we'll get rid of ours if you get rid of your 25. It's not a very proportionate thing. So the sad part is that in the misguided unilateral effort at free trade, we have actually weakened our ability, or the prior administrations more properly, have weakened our ability to make future trade deals. It will be right. I'm sorry, Becky. Let me ahead. just follow up on that for a moment. It, you've made that point in the past, Wilbur, and you're right. It, it sounds incredibly unfair when you lay out statistics like that. Uh, but how do we adjust that without expecting that these other nations, even though the deals were set that were unfair, how do we expect to fix that without having other nations come back and, and, and take some sort of, uh, have some sort of reaction and put other things up um, as a result? Because you're right, they're not going to just turn around and say, okay, we'll, we'll agree to do tit for tat at this point. Well, we're starting it with stricter enforcement, both as we showed here with the Canadians uh, in the lumber 
and on the other side. A few weeks ago, we put another one billion plus fine on a very large Chinese company called ZTE, the second largest telecom equipment people, because what they were doing was violating the sanctions on North Korea and on Iran. So the policy of this administration is, first of all, we will strictly enforce the WTO rules, whatever trade deals we have. That's number one. Number two, we will try to go to our trading counterparties, particularly those with whom we have big deficits, and say, look, there are a number of items that you buy, some from us and some from others. Since you're running a big trade surplus with us, you ought to give us a little better market share of things that you're buying anyway. Quick, that quick. costs them nothing. Tra transition to manpower, Wilbur, because even if, you, if, if you're right about everything, people I've talked to that have suggested, hey, I agree with everything that Trump and the Commerce Department is doing, they'll say this, it comes down to manpower. Multilateral deals are struck because you can make a lot of deals all at one time. Do you have the manpower? Do you have the time? Do you have the people that can literally go and negotiate with Mexico, negotiate with Canada, negotiate with China, no matter how complex something is, doesn't it come down to just people and time? Well, it does, but it also comes down to willpower and philosophy. I have, after all, negotiated quite a few deals over the years, so it is something that I'm not unfamiliar with. And it's not so much the volume of people, it's the way that you handle the process and the determination with which you go forward. You mentioned multilateral deals. Sure, you can make a multilateral deal. And what happens is, first of all, they take 10 years to do because you have so many moving parts. And that means with the way the world changes, they're practically obsolete by the time you settle them. But worse yet, there are two structural flaws. The first one is, let's say you're Japan and I go to you as the U.S. and I say, I want some agricultural concessions. And you say, well, okay, Mr. United States, but now here's what I want back from you. So they took a little nick out of us. Now let's say we go next to Vietnam, then we want some reforms there. And they'll say, sure, we'll do that, but here's what we want out of you. They take another little nick. Now we've been nicked twice, and Japan will benefit from what Vietnam got, even though they didn't ask for right. it. Vietnam will benefit from what Japan got, even though they didn't ask. So that's one problem. The other problem is when anybody's been negotiating the same deal for eight or ten years, you get so invested in the process that you just want to get a deal done, not to get the deal done. So I think there's, there are several flaws with multiple negotiation doesn't say it's impossible to do a multilateral deal, but if you look at a TPP, it was a mess. It was not, there were some good things in it, but also some very weak things. NAFTA is a mess, and right. NAFTA is also an obsolete deal. I think we have adequate manpower to deal with what we need. Mr. Secretary, uh, I wanted to get your comments on a story that was picked up by Politico this morning uh, about uh, Peter Navarro, who's been on this program uh, many a times. Uh, right. They write, is Navarro losing influence? President Donald Trump's reversal on labeling China as a currency manipulator, as well as overall softer stance towards a country he, meaning Peter Navarro, routinely lambasted on the campaign trail, have raised new questions about the role of a top member of his cabinet. What do you make of that? Well, for, first of all, I think the Politico and other people observing the White House love to stir up controversy, and it makes people read their media. So I, that doesn't surprise me too much. But if I'm not mistaken, when, while I was in Japan, Peter was very much with the president out in Wisconsin when they were announcing the Buy America, Hire America program. Um, I, don't, I don't see any signs of uh, the sort of dissent that are being chronicled. What I do see is something that you normally would see in a new administration. There naturally is some pulling and tugging within the administration, some different points of view. There's always a shakedown cruise for any new administration. But that's healthy. Right. 
because that means that different views are vetted. And when the president gets to make his decision, he's now heard various sides of the argument. So I would view that as constructive, not destructive. And Mr. Secretary, I just wanted to also help clarify one point. Earlier, uh, you, you, you made a comment suggesting that uh, the tax proposal we're hearing is a, quote, opening salvo. Does that mean that it's not something he thinks, uh, the president thinks is going to happen? It's, it's part of a negotiation? It's sort of anchoring one point to begin a conversation? Or, or, or at 15 percent in terms of the corporate rate is something that, that he thinks is a realistic number uh, that can get done? Well, the president doesn't bluff. He doesn't put forward make-believe proposals. I'm sure he has strong conviction that this would be a good proposal. The only thing I was pointing out was that obviously you have the two houses of Congress have to go along with it, and then within the houses you have the parties. Then it's hardly a secret to Squawk Box that we're in a very, very partisan environment, and we have a very small Republican majority in the Senate. So the idea that there should be some pulling and tugging as this goes through the process ought not to surprise anyone. Secretary Ross, I want to thank you very much for your time today. Well, thank you for having me on. Stay tuned. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.